Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Galia Benartzi, founder of the Bancor Protocol. I just want to start by saying that I speak uh, frequently in front of tech audiences and innovation audiences and financial audiences, um, and never have I been more humbled and grateful uh, than to speak in front of those who fight for freedom. So thank you. So the future of money uh, and user-generated currencies. Um, I really want to use uh, our time up here to zoom out a bit and talk about money itself, what it is, why we need it, why we have it, um, where maybe it went wrong, and how we might be able to fix it. And I start with this slide. Any useful statement about the future should at first seem ridiculous. Um, this photo was taken in downtown Palo Alto, where I grew up, in the heart of the Silicon Valley, and blessed with every human right, truly, um, that one can imagine. Um, and in Silicon Valley, the, the mandate and the ethos is that we can design and invent our way out of problems and that we can manifest the future uh, through technology. Um, another book that I love to, to share as a backdrop here uh, is Sapiens by Yuval Harari. And in the beginning of this book, uh, he distinguishes how humans are different than other animals on a level of consciousness. Um, and the way that we're different, he explains, is stories. We tell each other stories, we tell ourselves stories, and these stories govern our organizational ability uh, and truly this arc of humanity over time. So as a quick example, uh, if you were to put 100,000 apes in Times Square, you would very quickly see violence and chaos, more than likely. However, if you put 100,000 humans in Times Square, we generally figure it out. And that is because of the stories that we've told ourselves over generations. Stories like uh, how to behave in Times Square. Stories like walk on green, stop on red, traffic lights are here to protect you. Um, and there are billions of other stories truly that we tell ourselves. Um, and the reason I bring this up is that money is one of these stories. Money is a story that we've told ourselves about how we can collaborate as a society. So in the beginning of time, uh, we didn't have money. Money wasn't here before we were. We brought it into fruition. We invented it. Um, there are many reasons for this, and some of the most obvious are that in small groups, we had the trust, uh, the innate trust and the belief in the other people we were working with to not need to keep track of who was giving what and who had what. We simply did what we did. We woke up and we grew the food and we fed the people and we got the water and we clothed the children and we did the things uh, that we call living and we did them without any uh, need for accounting of who was doing what or a kind of non-quantitative accounting. As our collaboration grew into larger and larger groups, not just in our family, but in our tribe, not just in our tribe, but with other tribes, and fast forward to today, not just in our city or our neighborhood, but in our country and in all of the countries, we developed this shared accounting system, this tool for human collaboration at scale. And this accounting system, in its uh, most pure form, in its ideal form maybe, is meant to tell us whether any individual, ourselves included, is in balance with the system. Supposedly, if we have a lot of money, what that indicates to others and to the system is that we have given a lot to society. We have given a lot to other people. We have sold goods and services. We have helped. We have contributed. We have invented. We have provided some kind of value that allowed this money to flow our way. And our big stack of money is meant to show people how much we've given, and then to afford us to receive in return. Not necessarily from the person that gave to us, but from someone else in the system. It's a systemic flow accounting technology. So let's talk a little bit about money, what we actually used for this accounting system, what money has been, um, and what it is today. So what we call money 1.0, uh, money came from the earth. Right? We all remember this time money was gold, money was silver, uh, money was salt, money was oil, money was sticks or seashells, physical objects from the earth that we could all point to and say, you know, that's our accounting system. If you have a lot of it, you've given, and if you have not a lot of it, you haven't given, um, and we strive to stay in balance with the system, ideally. Money 2.0, and this is the era that we're in today, and perhaps change is upon us. Um, in Money 2.0, money comes from the government. 
right? So the government of every nation has been given the responsibility uh, and the privilege to decide what is money, how much of it there is, and most importantly, who gets it when it's fresh off the printing press or fresh off the digital press. Uh, where does it go and how is it distributed in society? And now we enter what I believe is the most exciting era of money. Um, and this is the era where money comes from the people. And when I say people, I mean the people uh, who invented Bitcoin, the people who invented Ethereum, me and my team who invented a currency called Bancor, and thousands and thousands and thousands of other teams out there that are inventing currency after currency, many of them you have heard of, many more of them you haven't heard of, and these are what we call cryptocurrencies today. And so when money comes from the people, we have a completely different paradigm, right? Because any one of these people can make a completely different decision about how they're creating the money, and most importantly, who gets it? What is the distribution mechanism for these monies? What is the monetary policy for any one of these currencies? So you might ask yourself at this moment, and this is what me and my team did six years ago at the beginning of a, a very long uh, startup struggle, was why can't anyone just make a money? We have the internet, we have smartphones, we have marketplaces. What is actually preventing us, aside from laws on the books, what is actually preventing humans from making money? The jig is up, money is what you believe it to be. If I make a money and you accept it, it's money. Um, so why isn't everyone doing this? And what we discovered is that what makes a money actually money, what gives, it, what gives it its value to begin with, is its liquidity. A liquid currency is a valuable currency. An illiquid currency is play money, right? And liquidity is the ability to have someone else accept your money at some given time for the good or service that you want, including some other money that you might want to trade your money for. And this liquidity is the lifeblood of a currency. And until today, we have only known these currencies to be liquid, generally. There are a few outliers uh, to this map, and of course today, Bitcoin and Ethereum and some of the other currencies join this map, but you can count these currencies on a few hands. These are a few hundreds of currencies that are liquid because the government's distribution of them has ensured to other people in other countries that they can use this money for some kind of goods and services. And of course, the exchange rates fluctuate and tell us how reliable is that promise of, of any given money. So I'll walk you through a very brief experiment that my team and I did uh, called Community Currency in Tel Aviv, in Israel. Um, we minted a digital currency called Hearts. In Hebrew, the word is Lev, and this marketplace was called the Heart Market, Lev Market. Um, this currency was created for mothers, and it was issued to mothers, and over 20,000 mothers joined the Currency Collective. Um, and essentially could earn these hearts for doing things that were valuable to this community of mothers. Those were things like volunteering in the schools, volunteering in the after-school programs, tutoring the children, picking up someone else's child from school and bringing them home, babysitting, baking a cake for a birthday party, really anything that you can imagine that was valuable to these families. Um, they received the hearts for joining, they received the hearts for bringing other women into the network, and they received the hearts for contributing in what we might call sweat equity to the community. And then they could spend these hearts uh, with other mothers in the community. And what we discovered was astounding. Um, in under a year, 20,000 mothers performed over $24 million worth of transactions, of commerce between them, just in hearts. Not a shekel, not a dollar ever changed hands. And what we asked ourselves was, why weren't they doing this to begin with? We didn't really invent anything here. All the mothers were there before. All the goods and services were there before. And of course, Israel has a national currency, the shekel, just like most countries have a national currency, and it's not even uh, a very volatile or vulnerable one. And so why wasn't this commerce happening? before the hearts uh, entered the scene? And the answer was, these mothers didn't have any shekels in their pockets. Specifically, these mothers were from low-income or at-risk communities, and all of the shekels that they had access to were allocated 
to rent, to food, to school, to gas, to bills and health insurance and all of the other payments, and there were no shekels left over at the end of the day to buy a birthday cake for a birthday party or to buy new toys or new clothes or things we might call discretionary spending. Um, and so what we realized in this experiment was that when we injected a community with more money, and of course that exercise involves trust and execution and user experience and all of the things, but when we injected a high quality currency tool into a community, commerce happened. People gave to each other, people bought from each other, people collaborated around local needs and goods and services uh, in the community. And there was incredible abundance uh, achieved in a short time. I take you now to this book, Rethinking Money, by Bernard Lyotard, who became the president of the Bancor Foundation. He's well known as being one of the co-creators of the Euro. Um, and in fact, he's one of the co-creators of the Euro project. He came from the Central Bank of Belgium, uh, who abandoned the Euro project as it was being, uh, let's call it, redesigned by the politicians for other needs. Um, and, and what Bernard has to say is that somewhere between one currency per nation and one currency per person is the right number of currencies for us to have true abundance among people. It's certainly more than one per nation. It's likely less than one per person, and it's somewhere in the middle. Um, and the paradigm that he describes with uh, community currencies and why may, we might want to have more than one currency per nation really is the spectrum between efficiency and resilience. Both good things, both bad things. And I leave you also with this thought that nothing is binary, right? Everything is, is a conversation. Even freedom can lead to democracies that lead to elections, that lead to leaders that we may not consider uh, good or bad, right? And so on this spectrum of efficiency and resiliency, basically he says, one world currency would be the most efficient the most efficient thing we can imagine. No exchange rates, everybody understands the money, we print it in one place, we give it to everyone, it's highly efficient. Just like a bulldozer that can log the entire rainforest in five minutes is highly, highly efficient. However, is efficiency the thing that we're striving for? Is it the thing that we're striving for above all? And this is the question today that we find ourselves in capitalist societies as well. On the other side, of the spectrum of efficiency, we have resilience. That rainforest is not very resilient to a very efficient bulldozer. Communities are not very resilient to very efficient monetary systems that suck jobs away to lower income or, or uh, more efficient labor economies, right? And so these are economic questions that are more about ethics than they are about math. Um, because the technology itself, money included, is morally agnostic and the designers of the technology, the people, uh, are the ones to endow it with the morals that we choose. And so Bernard notices that the UN Sustainable Devel Development Goals that we talk about a lot here um, amount to about $4 trillion. It would cost about $4 trillion, according to the UN, to solve almost all of our existential problems. You guys are familiar with this list, human trafficking, water, safety, all of the, all of the uh, basic human rights and basic human needs, $4 trillion, who's gonna pay? And we look around and I think all of us experience that, um, that deflationary feeling um, that no one is going to agree ever to contribute these $4 trillion to solve these problems. And so what Bernhard has to say is, why don't we mint a new $4 trillion? Why are we still relying on the old dollars, the old euros, the old yens, the old money to solve our problems, when clearly it has been shown that the system itself uh, gravitates towards the type of outcomes that we see today. So this graph is, uh, is meant to describe an, a phenomenon in the internet that we call the long tail. Has anyone heard of this term before? So the long tail is uh, the phenomenon that says when you lower technical barriers to entry, you have 
two to three orders of magnitude of volume in folks who might try to use a tool and approach a tool um, than you would otherwise. And so the, the thesis here is that if you lower technical barriers to entry, if you allow people to create their own currencies, and we're talking currencies you can't even imagine yet, currencies that link their money supply to the temperature of the earth, currencies that reward the teachers in a community before the bankers, any monetary policy that you can imagine can today be coded into cryptocurrencies and manifest into society. And so this long tail is what value looks like when not only governments or maybe large corporations can issue currency tools, uh, but truly anyone can try, anyone can approach the platforms, anyone can mint a money. And we'll see two to three orders of magnitude of the value between people um, than we do today. Thank you.